Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk about scaling secure service authentication. My name is Sven Torben Janus, and I work as a principal architect at Conciso with a focus on identity and access management, especially in the context of cloud native platforms. In this talk today, I want to share a practical approach for secure, scalable service to service authentication using Keycloak's built in token exchange mechanism. So, due to the limited amount of time we have today, let's dive straight into looking at the problem space that many platforms struggle with today. As you know, modern platform architectures involve dozens, even hundreds of services. Um, some face users directly, others work deep in the backend, but in the end, all need authentication. And all too often, tokens are shared or passed around like keys in a bowl. So tokens issued to front-end clients often leak into backend layers. We see services themselves often over-configured with overly broad credentials or default client access. And such lack of identity separation and control increases the attack surface of our platforms dramatically. So let's look at how delegation is typically handled in such platforms. Um, one option is to pass the original user token down the service chain. So when a front-end application, such as a web app or mobile app, um, authenticates a user, it typically receives an access token from an identity provider. Now, as the user interacts with the application, it may trigger operations that involve backend services. Um, so instead of each service handling its own authentication properly, many systems simply forward the original user access token from service to service. And that's what we sometimes refer to as poor man's delegation. So let's look at an example of such a call chain. So we have a front-end service that authenticates a user, gets an access token from an identity provider. And then the front-end service calls the backend service and forwards the user's access token. Now, when the backend service needs data from another service, so some internal other services, data services, databases, um, it forwards the same token again. So in each hop of this call chain um, forwards the same user token. And this is problematic in multiple ways. So on the one hand side, there is no audience restriction. So the token can be accepted by unintended services. Then these tokens are overprivileged. So we have overprivileged access. So services may use roles and scopes that never intended for them. And we have loss of trust boundaries. So there's no service isolation at all. Um, as said, that's why it's called poor man's delegation sometimes. Um, of course, there are other options. So one, for example, which is very common is to use a client credentials grant. So we have services authenticate themselves using service accounts. Um, however, this loses the user context. Um, sometimes I even see people trying to stitch together other ways manually. Um, anyways, in this talk, we'll focus on the first one because it's super widespread and it's super, super risky. Um, so this is a kind of token we see in poor man's delegation. We have a user identified by a subject claim. Um, we have a token that is issued, in this case, for a front end. So here indicated by the authorized party claim. And these tokens suddenly works for backend and data services, as we see here with the audience claim. So this breaks audience boundaries and violates the principle of least privilege. If such a token leaks, an attacker has very, very wide access to the platform. Um, now, this is where token exchange actually comes in. So token exchange is defined in RFC 8693, and it solves the delegation problem in a very clean and secure way. Um, instead of reusing the same access token across all the services, we issue new tokens explicitly tailored for each step in this request chain. So first, we take an existing token, which is typically issued to a front-end or, let's say, a user-facing client in general, and exchange it for a new token that is targeted at a specific downstream service. Um, this ensures that the audience is correct, meaning only that the service can validate and accept the token. So no other service would be able to do that. Second, the user's identity remains intact. So the downstream service still knows who the original user is, and it's not a blind service to service request. Um, that's especially critical for traceability and auditing. Um, and finally, um, scopes are reduced. That's also super important. So the token only contains the permissions that are relevant for that one service, and that dramatically re, um, reduces or limits the blast radius um, and follows least uh, privileged principles. So let's have a look at how this is supported in Keycloak. Um, so in the next part, I will walk you through a live example of how this works, from initial login to accessing a backend service and also securely exchanging tokens along the way. Um, this flow involves some configuration clients in Keycloak, expecting access tokens and performing token exchange via curl. So let's have a look at that. What you see here is the Keycloak admin UI. I've pre-configured some services uh, in here, or clients, as we call them. So we have the backend here, uh, the two data services here, and the front-end service. In addition, I've also conf pre-configured a user. It's the admin user. And we granted that user permissions on the data services with write access, the backend with admin access, and the front-end where it's just the user admin. 
So let's simulate a login to our front end client. We do this via curl here in this case, and we use a resource on a password grant, which basically means we are authenticating the admin user with his credentials and we log into the front end client in this case. We do that by, via Keycloak's token endpoint. And um, so we just execute that request. And what we get back is, as you see here, we get an access token, we get a refresh token and an identity token. What we care about is this access token. So the access token will be passed from the front end to the back end when the front end uh, calls the back end service. Um, so let's decode that one and have a look into the token. Um, so what we see here is that we have um, a subject claim which identifies the user by this ID. We have the authorized party, so we've logged into the front end client. We have the audiences. So as you can see here, we have a very broad audience scope. Um, so this token could be used for both data services and the backend, but we also have encoded all the roles. So as we've discussed previously, that's an issue because this token is overly privileged and um, has no clear audience boundary. So how do we fix this? First off, what you would want to do always in Keycloak is that um, if you have a specific client, for example, in this case, a front-end client, you would want to switch off this full scope allowed feature here because that basically would um, de-scope this token. So if we switch that off, and we go here and issue that request again, get another token back. If we decode that, you now see that this has zero audience here and only encoded the um, roles for the front end. So in this case, this token would not be very usable because um, we would like to have a token which we can use for the backend. So we would at least need an audience of the backend here and the roles of the backend encoded into um, this token. So. We'll to achieve that, you would assign some roles here, and we would just restrict this to the backend client. So we add the, all the backend client's roles in here, and if we now request this token again, decode it, we can now see that we have a token authorized as the front end, um, the front end client, the backend client um, is the audience, and we have all the roles for the backend in here. So now that the front end uh, holds such a token, it can pass this token to the backend. And once it does that, the backend will now check for um, permissions here by the roles and everything. And once that's fine, um, maybe the backend wants to call a data service. So it needs to retrieve some data. And it cannot pass this token along to the data service because the data service would not know what to do with this token. It would reject it because it's not part of the audience. And there are no roles encoded in here um, that could be used by the data service to make a proper authorization decision. Assuming um, the front end has passed this token to the backend service, the backend service would now need to exchange that token for one that it could use um, with the data service. So let's do this token exchange. So we use curl again, and in this case, we use a grant type token exchange. We authenticate the client, so in this case, the backend, which wants to execute that exchange. And now the backend would pass the access token from the front end to the Keycloak token endpoint. And while doing this, it says, okay, this is an access token I'm passing to the token endpoint, and it's requesting another access token. So if we execute that request, we see that there's an error. So in this case, the token exchange is not enabled for the backend client. So we need to explicitly allow the backend client to execute a token exchange. So let's do that. And as said before, it's super easy in the new Keycloak versions. We just have to switch it on and save the configuration, and here we go. So let's do this again, and as you can see, we now get a token back. Now let's have a look into that token. <coughs> so this token, again, it holds the subject, so we preserve the user context information. In this case, we also write the backend service, and we now have an audience claim so we, that the backend can use both data services. All the roles are encoded in here for the data services at the backend. You don't see the front end anymore. Um, so that's quite nice, but it's still a bit of a broad audience claim here. So let's assume the backend service just wants to call the data service two, for example. Um, in this case, we um, can try to downscope or down audience, as we sometimes say, um, this token. There is a parameter on the token exchange which allows us to do this. So you could execute a token exchange with this audience parameter and just specify data service two in this case. So if we do that, we get back a token. And as you can see, the audience in this case is just data service two. So this token you can't use with the data service one or any other service. It's just 
the audience is just the data service too. So we have a very narrow token scope. Now um, there's another aspect, as, aspect to this. We can also disallow um, the backend, in this case, to actually request tokens for this audience. So if we reduce the scope here and unassign the roles for the data service too, so if we issue this request for the audience for data service two again, um, we will see that this request fails. So because this audience is not available, so we can basically prevent um, the backend to exchange a token for um, data service two in this case. So we basically have a mechanism to decide which token exchanges are allowed by which client and towards with other which other client. So now that we've seen token exchange live in action, it's time to address another crucial aspect, and that's observability. Um, because what good is the security mechanism if you can't monitor it properly, right? So um, we need visibility into who exchanges tokens, when exchanges succeed or fail, and how services interact under the hood. So um, let's have another look at how Keycloak helps us achieve that. Um, so at first, Keycloak provides an auditing mechanism. It's a user event system built into Keycloak. And when properly configured, every token exchange, so both successful and failed attempts, can be recorded. So this gives us some kind of forensic trail and answering questions like um, which client initiated the exchange, which target audience was requested, and whether the operation succeeded or failed. Um, especially for platforms operating under compliance regimes like ISO, SOC2, GDPR, um, having such audit logs for authentication and authorization flows is not optional, so it's mandatory. And Keycloak lets us forward those logs into centralized systems like Siam if we have proper extensions configured. Um, that they can then be analyzed, alerted on, or achieved for audits. Um, so, but logging events is not just about failure. Um, by default, Keycloak primarily logs errors, but if we want full visibility, um, especially in larger platforms, you may want that, we should also log successful exchanges. So um, this way we can correlate service activity and detect patterns and spot anomalies very early. Um, and we can do this by enabling it by setting two environment variables in Keycloak configuration. Um, you have them here on the slide. It's especially important to erase the success level from debug to info in Keycloak. Otherwise, you will not see uh, successful logs. So with this setup, um, we don't just capture what went wrong. We also capture um, the success cases and the complex systems that's operational context is actually gold. Um, so, of course, beyond logs, um, we want metrics, right? Um, so Keycloak exposes Prometheus compatible metrics, and here's a specific one we would care about. That's the Keycloak user events total metric. So um, the metric tells us um, how many user-related events occurred, um, including the token exchange, and it comes with some useful labels. For example, you have the realm, so you can later filter your metrics based on a tenant or environment, depending what a realm actually means to you. You have the client ID to see which service is exchanging a token. You have the IDP label where, for example, if you have multiple identity providers in play, um, can distinguish between them. And of course, you have an error label, so you can differentiate success from failure and also different failure scenarios. So with proper Grafana dashboards and alerting rules, you can easily track things like, I don't know, sudden spikes and exchange errors, misbehaving clients, um, authentication trends across your platform. And basically, with this metrics logs, um, the token exchange becomes kind of a first-class citizen of your platform observability stack. So that said, and before we close, um, let's summarize some important takeaways. So first, um, token exchange simplifies delegation dramatically, as we've seen. We no longer have to rely on forwarding user tokens across services or deal with hard-coded client secrets. Each service gets a clean, properly scoped token. <clears throat> then second, the user context is preserved throughout the entire service chain. So ma no matter how many services are involved, every token carries a clear trace of who the user is. That's providing accountability and auditability. Third, token exchange enforces service separation. So scopes and audience are used correctly, ensuring that services only receive the permissions they actually need, no more and no less. Finally, um, token exchange is a natural fit for modern dynamic platform architectures. Whether you're dealing with hundreds of services, um, multiple clusters, or hybrid environments, token exchange can scale with you. It's a practical security-focused solution that allows platform architects like, like us to move fast without compromising safety in the end. 
So with this, we come to an end. So thank you very much for joining the session. Um, if you'd like to dive deeper into token exchange, share experience, or just continue the conversation, feel free to contact me. Um, you'll find me on GitHub, LinkedIn, or by email. Um, and if you're building operating key cloud platforms, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so stay secure, stay scalable, and enjoy PlatformCon.